Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on work and energy. The topic of this video is potential energy, and we want to know what is gravitational potential energy and how do you calculate it, and what is elastic potential energy and how do you calculate that. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Potential energy is the energy stored in an object as a result of its position. There's numerous types of potential energy forms that we could talk about, but we're going to restrict the discussion here to gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy. As an example of gravitational potential energy, consider the wrecking ball of a demolition machine raised high above its lowest position. Because of the position of the ball relative to Earth's gravitational field, it has stored energy of position, gravitational potential energy. As an example of elastic potential energy, consider the stretched bowstring of a bow and arrow set. Because of the position of the string relative to its usual resting position, it possesses elastic potential energy. As mentioned, gravitational potential energy is the energy stored in an object as a result of that object's position relative to Earth's gravitational field. This type of energy depends on two variables, the mass of the object and the vertical position of the object, also known as the height of the object. Here's the Earth, and here's an object on the surface of the Earth. It has zero height, and thus zero potential energy. But if I apply a force on that object to lift it upwards some distance, I do work upon that object, and that gives the object potential energy. The more distance I apply that force, the higher I lift it, and thus the more work that's done and potential energy that's stored in the object. I can continue to lift it higher and higher, and the object has a greater and greater potential energy. This is the energy stored in an object due to its vertical position. The amount of potential energy stored in the Earth object gravitational system depends upon two variables, the mass of the object denoted by the symbol m and the height of the object denoted by the symbol h. The equation that expresses this dependency is PE equal m times g times h. Here the m is mass in units of kilograms and the h is the height in units of meters. The g represents the gravitational field strength and on Earth its value is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Some teachers will approximate that to 10 newtons per kilogram. Now when it comes to units, the standard unit of energy is the joule, abbreviated J. If we think about how that fits into this equation, what we would say is that one joule would have to be equal to the unit of mass times the unit of G times the unit of H, and that would be a kilogram times a newton per kilogram multiplied by a meter. The kilogram and the per kilogram would cancel one another out, and so we could say that the unit of potential energy here is a newton times a meter, which in a previous video we described as the unit of work. Work and energy share the same units, the newton times meter or the joule. One way that we can and should think about equations in physics is as a guide to thinking about how a change in one variable might affect another variable. And from the equation for gravitational potential energy, we would reason that as the height increases, so would the potential energy. And as the height decreases, the gravitational potential energy would decrease as well. And if over the course of a motion, the height is constant, then you know that the potential energy would be constant. Wherever you would notice the height to be greatest over the course of an object motion, that's the location you know that the gravitational potential energy is greatest. And wherever the height is lowest, that's where the gravitational potential energy is the least. As the height goes, so goes the potential energy. In order to calculate the potential energy of the object, you need to know the object's height. But in order to measure an object height, you need to know what the zero height is, or the zero level. Quite surprisingly, the zero level is a totally arbitrary decision. You make the decision based on what's most convenient. For example, if you're doing a physics lab on the second floor of the building, it's not real convenient to call the zero height the height of the floor on the first floor of the building. It's more convenient to call zero height the height of the floor on the second floor of the building. Or, if that lab's being on top of a table, then you'd simply call the tabletop zero height and measure to objects upward from the tabletop. 
As an illustration of the importance of the zero level, consider this staircase diagram with steps 0.5 meters apart, with balls on each step having a mass of 1 kilogram. We're going to calculate the potential energy of each ball based upon three arbitrary assignments of zero levels, level 1, level 2, and level 3. We're going to record the values in the data table here, and as we do, we're going to use a value of g of 10 newtons per kilogram. For zero level number one, the height of ball E at the lowest step, we would measure the height of ball A to be two meters above, ball, above the zero level. Ball B, 1.5 meters above. Ball C and F would be one meter above. And ball D would be a half a meter above. And when we use these heights, we would calculate these values of potential energy using the equation one kilogram times 10 newtons per kilogram times these heights. Now when we switch over to zero level two, we're picking ball C and E to be, C and F to be the zero levels. And when we do, we're measuring the height of ball A to be one meter above zero zero, ball B a half a meter above zero, ball D would be a half a meter below zero and thus have a negative potential energy. Ball E would also have a negative height of one meter and a negative potential energy and this is the result when we do our calculations. Now finally for the third zero level, for the assigning ball A to be at zero height, when we do our measurements of heights for ball C through F, we would get negative values for these heights. P negative 0.5 for ball B, negative 1 for ball C and F, negative 1.5 meters for ball D, and negative 2 meters for ball E, leading to these calculations of potential energies based upon the zero level being that of ball A. The PE equation has three variables and a constant. The constant is g, and the variables are PE, m, and h, and we can use the equation to calculate any of those three variables. The basic idea is that if you happen to know two of the three variables, you could calculate the third using that one equation. Seems rather straightforward that if you wanted to calculate the PE, you just go m times g times h. But what if you wanted to calculate the mass? Well, first, you would need to know the value of PE in joules and h in meters, and then rearrange the equation so as to solve for mass. That would mean you'd have to divide both sides of the top equation by g and by h, yielding the equation m equal pe divided by g times h. The way you would use this is you would calculate the entire denominator and divide it into the numerator. What if you wanted to calculate the value of h? Well, you would need to know the value of pe in joules and the value of m in kilograms and rearrange the equation to the form h equal pe divided by mg, or the weight of the object. So you would substitute the pe value into the numerator and divide by both the m and the g in the denominator, and that would allow you to calculate the h value. Let's continue our discussion of elastic potential energy by discussing the so-called spring force. If we have a coiled spring, one thing that we would notice is that if you apply a force to the spring, you begin to stretch or compress the coils depending on the direction of the force. As you see in the first diagram on the far left, this vertically hanging spring is at its resting or equilibrium position. But if we hang 10 newtons on that spring, we stretch the coils of the spring. If we hang 20 newtons on the spring, we stretch the coils even more. With zero newtons applied to that spring, what we would notice is that there would be absolutely no stretch. With 10 newtons, there'd be some stretch. With 20 newtons, there'd be twice as much stretch. 30 newtons would stretch it even more, and 40 newtons even more. One thing we notice about this graph is that the amount of stretch is directly proportional to the amount of applied force. In fact, we can express it as an equation known as the Hooke's Law equation, that the force of the spring is equal equal to a proportionality constant multiplied by the amount of stretch, delta x. In this equation, the proportionality constant has special meaning. We call it the spring constant. It has units of newtons per meter and generally is a larger value for a more rigid, stiffer spring and a smaller value for a softer spring. This spring constant happens to be the slope of the f versus delta x graph. As you apply a force to stretch or compress the coils of a spring, you begin to store elastic potential energy in that spring system. The more you stretch or compress those coils, the more potential energy that's stored in that spring.
The equation that is related to this is that the elastic potential energy is equal to 1 half times k times delta x squared. Here, delta x refers to the amount of stretch or compression of the coils relative to the resting position, and the k refers to the spring constant of that spring. k depends solely upon the spring. One thing to note is that the potential energy is always positive regardless of whether you stretch or compress the coils of that spring. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources that you can find on our website. We've left links to each one in the description section of this video. We have two concept builders, a Minds on Physics mission, and a tutorial page. Any one of these would be great next steps for making your learning stick. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.